Good evening, friends and colleagues. I am sincerely grateful for this award. I would like to thank Merck sincerely for their sponsorship of the award. Merck has been a leader and a pioneer in the pharmaceutical industry for over a century, and it is a distinct honor to be associated with this company in this way. I know we are all thankful to Merck and to Barry Buckland in particular for honoring metabolic engineering by creation of this award. I worked in my lab or spent any time there knows that most of the ideas and all of the work comes from my students and research co-workers. To the students and colleagues at Caltech who led the way from earlier studies on gene expression into our first forays into metabolic engineering, to the students, co-workers, colleagues at the ETH in Zurich who helped expand that research into new territory and to kick it up a notch in general, this award is for you. This award comes at a special time for me and takes on a special significance because of this. As many of you know, about one year ago, I was diagnosed with metastatic colon cancer. My doctors in Switzerland gave me three months to live. My son, Sean, came to my rescue immediately, found an excellent team of doctors at the University of Southern California, found this condominium where I have spent most of my hours and almost all of my days for the past year, and otherwise supported me in every possible way in this fight. Thanks to an outstanding and very funny uh, and energetic oncologist, a brilliant surgeon, some new medicines, and many expressions of support, sympathy, and many prayers from friends and family all over the world, including many in this room. This fight has so far been quite successful. Since April of this year, I have had no detectable cancer. I just finished one additional course of chemotherapy and have had in the last two weeks a more extensive series of tests which again show no detectable disease. This fight is not over, but it is going in a good way so far. About this uh, hair, or lack of same, uh, one of the many things I've learned during this uh, past year is about chemotherapy and hair. The kind of chemotherapy I had kills hair, but as Dr. Lenz, my oncologist, assured me it grows back, but he told me it won't grow back like it was before. During a long break from chemotherapy to have surgery, sure enough, the hair grew back again, uh, that time rather thick, a uh, little brown, a little curly, uh, more hair than I had before in a chemotherapy. Uh, but I have had additional chemotherapy since then. That hair has been completely killed. It's gone now. And what's coming in now, uh, who knows? It may be purple, it may be curly, it may be straight. But uh, whatever it is, I can tell you, I don't particularly care. Sorry to Merck, I know you sell people medications to grow hair, but after the experience I've had for the last year, what kind of hair I have and whether or not I have any hair isn't really a very important thing uh, one learns 
by these experiences uh, what's important and what is less so. There's one final point I'd like to make in this area. Colon cancer is the number three most prominent cancer in the United States and yet it is completely preventable. All that is necessary is to have early and regular colon exams. Now, how was I stupid enough to get such a serious case of a preventable disease? First, I thought that what I was doing in late 98 and early 99 was just too important to go to a doctor even though I was having symptoms. I was too busy. Second, I really didn't know that regular colon exams should be started at age 50 earlier if there's any history of colon cancer in your family and I waited too long for to begin this examination process. Please have the examination in, in time and more generally take care of yourself. Nothing is more important. If I had a slide projector and those of you who have heard me speak before know that I use a lot of slides and that's really to help me out and give me cues as to what to say next. Now I don't have the benefit of that. I have to refer to these notes a little bit. There would be a slide that would say the changing scope or the changing definition of metabolic engineering. The early and still currently used definitions of metabolic engineering spoke to a technological endeavor, a process of finding genetic modifications which would in some desired sense improve the operation of a cell. This was the primary goal. Why the improvement occurred and exactly what was happening at a molecular and mechanistic scale to give rise to the observed changes was something that was nice to know that some of us worked to try to understand a bit, but it isn't the primary goal of the enterprise. Now, I think in any field of research, to stay at the forefront and to maximize the contributions which the research makes, we must constantly reassess the resources which are available for our research, and we must also consider these relative to the most important needs and problems of society. And we should try to bring these together in the most creative and productive way to define our projects and to set our goals. I believe that the arrival of completely sequenced genomes not only is a major new resource for metabolic engineering, but also creates a new problem, a new field, which we might call metabolic genomics or physiological genomics to distinguish it from functional genomics, which already has taken on a variety of meanings, but I think the most common of which is what protein function is encoded by a particular gene. This field of metabolic genomics means how quite generally does the genome influence the physiology of the organism. Is this synonymous with metabolic engineering as it's currently defined? I don't think so. I think that in metabolic engineering, we're trying to find a genetic change which gives us some improvement in a particular aspect of cell function, 
whereas in metabolic genomics we pursue a fundamental understanding of how the entire genome relates to any aspect of the organism's physiology. Should engineers and technologists concern themselves with such a problem that is really basic science? I would say yes for a couple of reasons. One is that the practical and technological implications of any significant progress in this metabolic genomics field will be tremendous. Second, I think that metabolic engineers have the experience, the tools, the intuition, which are well suited to address this problem, better suited than any other research community I can think of. I think that the microbial and cell culture systems that we work with are probably the best ones to use to try to discover and articulate the principles of genome physiology relationships. But I think that with this as our goal, the kinds of genetic modifications we should make, the kinds of cultures we should propagate, the kinds of measurements we should make, the kinds of models and computational algorithms we should apply to the data from these measurements are rather different from those pertinent and most effective for metabolic engineering and I think we should give this somewhat expanded definition of metabolic engineering to encompass metabolic genomics some additional effort and some additional creative thought. Now, changing topics again, uh, this is, I realize, uh, an after-dinner occasion giving a talk in such a context is always difficult and this is made uh, probably even more boring for all of you by seeing this talk on a TV monitor. So I thought it might uh, give some additional life and be a little bit of fun to uh, sing a song or, or two in the context of uh, this brief talk I'm making this evening, and uh, I've chosen The Times They Are A-Changing by Bob Dylan because sequence genomes means that the times are changing and have changed for us. Now, one verse of this song uh, fits our current situation pretty well. So now I'd like to do that, uh, that one verse, and please uh, forgive the production quality here. I couldn't find a way to connect a better, closer microphone to this video camera. So uh, just using the microphones on the camera, the sound quality is not so fantastic. That's the reason the song doesn't sound better now, by the way. So let's go to the song. Sinking like a stone is undoubtedly a bit of an overstatement. Um, later, after remarks on a few more topics, uh, we'll come back to this same melody but with some new lyrics that I've written for tonight's occasion. 
Now imagine a slide that says tools of metabolic engineering. Uh, next I'd like to make some comments on tools and areas of metabolic engineering to raise questions for consideration concerning our future research activities in our field. First, I think that we would benefit from more research and development on genetic tools. I think it's a mistake to assume that all of the vectors that we need in our work have already been made and are all available from some catalog or by writing to some other lab. Further developments are needed. Also, I think it would be good for the field if some groups would begin to work in more complex organisms, flies, worms, rats, mice, the, the systems that have been well developed in biology, systems that we will need to study if we want to begin to make contributions to understanding and to engineering of development in highly differentiated organisms. Always new analytical methods are useful. I think these will be particularly important in the future in the setting of obtaining the maximum possible amount of information from small-scale cultures. Uh, more on that in a minute. Uh, transcript profiling chips and membranes have become very popular. I know there were several presentations this week on these topics. These provide massive data sets of interesting and important information, but we should remember that this information is not determining in the sense that protein level in steady state is not proportional to transcript level or to corresponding changes are not proportional and of course the amount of a protein is likewise not proportional to its in vivo activity. However, transcript profiling data like two-dimensional gel electrophoresis data on proteins, proteomic data before have served to show us previously unseen and unexpected complexities in cell response to either genetic or environmental changes, which means that we face very difficult problems in trying to improve cells in the traditional metabolic engineering context or in trying to arrive at a general understanding of genome physiology relationships in the future. For research, I think we need more development of small-scale cultures, say one microtiter well and less. I think we need these to construct physiological libraries, that is libraries of physiological responses, which correspond to different types of well-chosen genetic libraries. I believe that this type of experimentation and these types of systems may prove essential in penetrating the fog now enveloping the genome physiology mappings. We need new mathematical and computational tools simply to deal with the massive large data sets we are obtaining now, for one thing. But I think we need a new type of tool to interface biological knowledge, which we have currently, with the emerging data from experimental biology. This doesn't usually happen so well. Um, I used to subscribe to a number of genomics journals thought it's the genomics era, now it's the post-genome era. Uh, I should keep track of uh, what this field is and try to understand something about it. What I found when I looked at these journals were articles about ATCG 
and different strings of them and different algorithms for analyzing strings of them and patterns of them and so on, but very, very little biological content and very little reference to known mechanisms and phenomena in biology. We need to get these together. Also, we need new mathematical modeling and computational tools which somehow synthesize and amalgamate in an effective way mechanistic models, cybernetic concepts, that is those based on hypotheses that cells are self-optimizing systems, and also simple empirical models of certain aspects of cell operation which we don't wish to describe or cannot describe in such detail. I do not think we need the massive computer simulators which blindly incorporate hundreds or thousands of components just because they're in a database. The kinds of models that some groups are talking about now and working on now. Uh, I cringe to some degree at some of these current in silico biology projects which seek to construct large models in a thoughtless way. Engineers should provide critical guidance, and I mean critical both in the sense of essential and in terms of uh, criticism and careful monitoring uh, and leadership in this field. Many complex systems petrochemical systems, solid-state chemistry and physics systems, uh, complex structures, complex buildings, have been very successfully understood and engineered by different branches of engineering, and they did this by identifying the essential components, the essential interactions describing and understanding those and not getting confused and distracted by throwing the kitchen sink and everything else into their thinking. On another point, I think we need more research programs which integrate computation and modeling with experiment and in particular with experiment at the genetic level. I think it's not so easy to get your hands around the fundamental or the applied genome physiology questions we face without constructing new genomes, without constructing new organisms, and studying their properties. Now, next I'd like to change to another topic some general areas of metabolic engineering that might be interesting in the future. Much of our previous work and many of our tools we've developed during this work have focused on series or networks of enzyme-catalyzed reactions. Considering their great importance, I think that not enough attention and effort has been devoted to regulatory and to information processing pathways and mechanisms in cells. Dealing with these types of pathways is somewhat outside the scope of some of our uh, most familiar and most favorite metabolic engineering tools, so this gives us a good opportunity and a nice challenge to develop new tools to go with this area. Also, the cell environment has a big effect on these regulatory systems as well as direct effects on metabolism. I think we need to remember that we work with cells in populations and these cells are communicating with each other via various signals, some of them quite specific, 
For example, even a bacterial cytokine has been reported. Most dramatic, I think, among environmental effects on genome manifestation and function has been the successful cloning of a number of animals. Just imagine if we take the genetic material from the nucleus of a fully differentiated adult cell and place that in a different environment within the environment of an embryonic cell, we can grow a whole organism. Now this is a very dramatic example, but there are other examples which are also very dramatic and uh, which I think point the way to exciting opportunities in the future. For example, experiments which have shown that nerve cells can be reprogrammed to become marrow cells and vice versa. Knowing more about the signals which determine differentiation of cells will allow us in the future to engineer differentiation and to have major benefits in tissue engineering and perhaps even in vivo regrowth of vital organs or damaged tissues. The whole area of environmental effects on cells has metabolic engineering implications because we can engineer the amount of the signal which a cell puts out we can engineer how it responds to that signal, or we can engineer bypassing response to that signal altogether. Now imagine, uh, now imagine a new slide which says failure of the modern drug discovery paradigm, a monument to biological complexity. If we put a cloning vector in a cell, if we express or delete a single gene, or if we make any significant change in the cell environment, and then we examine the consequences using transcript profiling or two-dimensional protein electrophoresis, what we find is a large-scale system-wide response in which tens, hundreds of transcripts and proteins are changing level. This is an indication that cells are integrated complex systems. In fact, I think the term the physiological or metabolic function of a gene may not have any real fundamental meaning or such a question may have no fundamental meaning because no gene operates by itself. Such a term of course has technological or phenomenological meaning in the sense we know well in metabolic engineering we can add or knock out a gene and a certain physiological change occurs, but we really don't know if it's because of that particular protein we manipulated or one of the hundred others which changed as part of the system-wide response. Now, given this, why is it that drug companies depend upon single molecule molecular targets as the basis for screening for useful new pharmaceuticals. Of course, the method has worked in a number of cases. If you are dealing with a pathogen that has certain pathways or processes not found in human cells, or if you're simply trying to stop uh, something from happening in a cell and there's a single pathway which does it, then trying to attack 
and to manipulate with a drug a particular single step is a good strategy and it's been very helpful. But many of the current goals of the pharmaceutical industry, many of the needs we have for new medicines, involve changing cell operation in particular ways and this is a much more difficult problem in view of these system-wide responses which we now know always occur. There are, I think, clear indications that this single target strategy has, as a strategy, as a concept, reached its limits. Combinatorial chemistry and combinatorial in vivo chemistry and combinatorial biosynthesis has given the pharmaceutical industry a hugely expanded library of chemical entities to test. Genomics, molecular biology has at the same time, actually a little bit later in time, uh, because these have been different waves of enthusiasm and uh, optimism in the industry that now finally there was a way to have a breakthrough in the rate of new drug discovery targets. We have now an overload of targets from genomics. It appears that no matter how many compounds we throw at how many targets by how many robots, the output of new drugs as measured by new drug introductions by the pharmaceutical industry has not changed very much. This seems to me a clear indication, if not a proof, that the limitation is not the set of inputs to this process, not the resources for this process. We have an excess of such resources right now. It's that the basic concept, the basic method has reached its limits. It's saturated. It's not going to give us new drugs any faster no matter what we do. This means then that we need a whole new idea a whole new approach of how to try to find effective and safe new drugs for the new medical problems we're facing now. What is the answer? Uh, I wish I knew, I certainly don't. Uh, but it likely depends on greater recognition of biological complexity and of ways for approaching that complexity in a serious way, in a creative way, experimentally and perhaps computationally, in order to better understand how different chemicals affect the entire cell system and ultimately the entire organism system. Finally, I'd like to make some comments on strategies and structures for metabolic engineering. That's the next slide over here. Um, of course, there are many more important problems, opportunities in metabolic engineering, many exciting projects besides those I've mentioned tonight. How can we get these projects done? How can we achieve our goals? How can we reach the full potential of th this field? I think this depends upon the environment in which we work and the way in which we work. And this is my final uh, topic before a little bit more uh, singing. Um, first, 
I'd like to say that it's my opinion, and indeed it's been my experience, that progress in metabolic engineering will come best from large multidisciplinary groups, which are, and here's the key phrase, working together under the same roof on common problems with shared goals. We need to get these people together and attack these difficult problems as an integrated team. The facts, the approaches, the intuition in each area are different. All of these fields and others, fields of biology, biochemistry, microbiology, cell biology, engineering, mathematics, modeling, computation, have important components to offer to a metabolic engineering project. They need to work together, they need to work in harmony and in contact. Now, this kind of interaction and this kind of cooperation between people from different backgrounds I don't think can occur nearly so effectively in a multi-investigator, multi-institutional project setting. However, unfortunately, this is the structure, this is the collaborative configuration which has been imposed on our field by the funding agencies we depend on. The funding agencies in the United States, the funding agencies in the European uh, community. I think if you look at the outcome of these large multi-investigator projects, Quite frankly, it's often quite disappointing. Um, there are exceptions. In our field, Terry Papatsakis' work on genetic manipulation of clostridia relating to solvents production is a, a marvelous example of a multi-investigator project that worked very effectively and made the best of all the participants capabilities in getting that project done. But usually a lot is lost. Each group involved in a big project is, so far as that big project is concerned, contributing a fragment. It's a fragment of the big project. It's a fragment of the work of the lab involved. I think it's much better to have these large multi-discipline, multi-investigator groups actually working together. Now, how can we try to fund such groups and see more of them uh, created? Uh, one solution which isn't widely applicable is the one I found in Zurich. There are certain parts of the world which support large groups and one can build uh, a multi-investment investigator, multidisciplinary group under your own roof within that structure, although still there are often many non-idealities, not in my case, but I know of another in which a lab headed by an engineer is restricted by the funding agencies from doing any recombinant DNA work in that lab, and that's really unfortunate and counterproductive. Another possibility is to go private. Uh, there is plenty of investment capital around in the United States and in Europe, eager to find important new ideas, important new projects, and I think in some situations 
making a startup company and getting funding for it may be the best way to put together the multi-investigator, multidisciplinary group which is needed to solve an important big problem. Uh, Celera Genetics right now is, uh, or genomics, is uh, uh, incredible example of this uh, and hopefully we'll see some others. As a final idea, the public interest in and support of big scientific projects has been stimulated and, and stimulated very positively by the success of the Human Genome Project. Big science projects which have important goals for mankind I think can be funded. What about a metabolic genomics project? What about a physiological genomics project? I'm aware of a very large international project which has already garnered substantial amounts of funding called structural genomics. The idea being to determine the three-dimensional structure of the protein products of all of the genes. Uh, I don't want to comment on that project in particular. Let's just say that a well-designed and effective project on metabolic genomics would have great obvious benefits for mankind in medicine and in food and in uh, materials and I think uh, should be something that could be done. Maybe we could think about it, maybe we could return to this at Metabolic Engineering 4, maybe somebody will bring a, a draft concept for such a project. I should note in mentioning such a project that this is certainly not a new idea and in fact there's a project of this kind has already been uh, conceived and and built up. Uh, Steve Oliver from Manchester within the European Framework 4 program launched a project on functional analysis of yeast and built a very large team well organized to try to figure out how yeast works in relation to its genome. Unfortunately, funding for this project was cut off at about the time that the project was fully organized and running. A very serious, uh, terrible mistake, I think, by the decision makers in the European research establishment. But that shouldn't discourage us from trying again. Back to that Bob Dylan tune uh, with some new and sometimes somewhat tortured uh, lyrics that I've written for the occasion and uh, this time we'll do it with the full uh, Bob Dylan regalia. Uh, so let's see how this works.
technologies will give us clear sight of networks delights for the times they are achieving. next meeting. Take care of yourself. Good evening, friends and colleagues. I am sincerely grateful for this award. I would like to thank Merck sincerely for their sponsorship of the award. Merck has been a leader and a pioneer in the pharmaceutical industry for over a century, and it is a distinct honor to be associated with this company in this way. I know we are all thankful to Merck and to Barry Buckland in particular 
for honoring metabolic engineering by creation of this award. In my lab, or spend any time there, knows that most of the ideas and all of the work comes from my students and research co-workers. To the students and colleagues at Caltech who led the way from earlier studies on gene expression into our first forays into metabolic engineering, to the students, co-workers, colleagues at the ETH in Zurich who helped expand that research into new territory and to kick it up a notch in general, this award is for you. This award comes at a special time for me and takes on a special significance because of this. As many of you know, about one year ago, I was diagnosed with metastatic colon cancer. My doctors in Switzerland gave me three months to live. My son, Sean, came to my rescue immediately, found an excellent team of doctors at the University of Southern California, found this condominium where I have spent most of my hours and almost all of my days for the past year, and otherwise supported me in every possible way in this fight. Thanks to an outstanding and very funny uh, and energetic oncologist, a brilliant surgeon, some new medicines, and many expressions of support, sympathy, and many prayers from friends and family all over the world, including many in this room, this fight has so far been quite successful. Since April of this year, I have had no detectable cancer. I just finished one additional course of chemotherapy and have had in the last two weeks a more extensive series of tests which again show no detectable disease. This fight is not over but it is going in a good way so far. About this uh, hair or lack of same, uh, one of the many things I've learned during this uh, past year is about chemotherapy and hair. The kind of chemotherapy I had kills hair, but as Dr. Lenz, my oncologist, assured me it grows back, but he told me it won't grow back like it was before. During a long break from chemotherapy to have surgery, sure enough, the hair grew back again, uh, that time rather thick, a uh, little brown, a little curly, uh, more hair than I had before any chemotherapy. Uh, but I have had additional chemotherapy since then. That hair has been completely killed. It's gone now. And what's coming in now, uh, who knows, it may be purple, it may be curly, it may be straight. But uh, whatever it is, I can tell you, I don't particularly care. Sorry to Merck, I know you sell people medications to grow hair, but after the experience I've had for the last year, what kind of hair I have and whether or not I have any hair isn't really a very important thing. Uh, one learns by these experiences uh, what's important and what is less so. There's one final point I'd like to make in this area. Colon cancer is the number three most prominent cancer in the United States, and yet it is completely preventable. All that is necessary is to have early and regular colon exams. Now, how was I stupid enough to get such a serious case 
of a preventable disease. First, I thought that what I was doing in late 98 and early 99 was just too important to go to a doctor even though I was having symptoms. I was too busy. Second, I really didn't know that regular colon exams should be started at age 50 earlier if there's any history of colon cancer in your family and I waited too long for to begin this examination process. Please have the examination in, in time and more generally take care of yourself. Nothing is more important. If I had a slide projector, and those of you who have heard me speak before know that I use a lot of slides, and that's really to help me out and give me cues as to what to say next. Now I don't have the benefit of that. I have to refer to these notes a little bit. There would be a slide that would say the changing scope or the changing definition of metabolic engineering. The early and still currently used definitions of metabolic engineering spoke to a technological endeavor, a process of finding genetic modifications which would in some desired sense improve the operation of a cell. This was the primary goal why the improvement occurred and exactly what was happening at a molecular and mechanistic scale to give rise to the observed changes was something that was nice to know that some of us worked to try to understand a bit, but it isn't the primary goal of the enterprise. Now, I think in any field of research, to stay at the forefront and to maximize the contributions which the research makes, we must constantly reassess the resources which are available for our research and we must also consider these relative to the most important needs and problems of society and we should try to bring these together in the most creative and productive way to define our projects and to set our goals. I believe that the arrival of completely sequenced genomes not only is a major new resource for metabolic engineering, but also creates a new problem, a new field, which we might call metabolic genomics or physiological genomics to distinguish it from functional genomics, which already has taken on a variety of meanings, but I think the most common of which is what protein function is encoded by a particular gene. This field of metabolic genomics means how, quite generally, does the genome influence the physiology of the organism? Is this synonymous with metabolic engineering as it's currently defined? I don't think so. I think that in metabolic engineering we're trying to find a genetic change which gives us some improvement in a particular aspect of cell function, whereas in metabolic genomics we pursue a fundamental understanding of how the entire genome relates to any aspect of the organism's physiology. Should engineers and technologists concern themselves with such a problem that is really basic science? I would say yes for a couple of reasons. 
One is that the practical and technological implications of any significant progress in this metabolic genomics field will be tremendous. Second, I think that metabolic engineers have the experience, the tools, the intuition, which are well suited to address this problem, better suited than any other research community I can think of. I think that the microbial and cell culture systems that we work with are probably the best ones to use to try to discover and articulate the principles of genome physiology relationships. But I think that if this is our goal, the kinds of genetic modifications we should make, the kinds of cultures we should propagate, the kinds of measurements we should make, the kinds of models and computational algorithms we should apply to the data from these measurements are rather different from those pertinent and most effective for metabolic engineering and I think we should give this somewhat expanded definition of metabolic engineering to encompass metabolic genomics some additional effort and some additional creative thought. Now, changing topics again, uh, this is, I realize, uh, an after-dinner occasion. Giving a talk in such a context is always difficult, and this is made uh, probably even more boring for all of you by seeing this talk on a TV monitor. So I thought it might uh, give some additional life and be a little bit of fun to